Here we are, Ebba Vale, the site of the old steelworks. This valley was the Valley of Steel, contributed so much to the worldwide making of iron, steel and tin mill products. Started work in October, October the 8th, 1959, as an office trainee. I, I was 16 working years old, straight out of school. RTBs as it was then, in 1975. I started work in 1964 as a clerical apprentice. I was interviewed uh, in December 1954. Started in 1956 at 16 as an apprentice fitter in Turner. The first day was quite terrifying because your induction included a walk through the hot mill. I ended up on the plant scheduling and I stayed there for 38 years. To see the works for the first time on the mountainside, looking down across the plant, the bottom end would be the most dramatic you would ever see constant bursts of red smoke, red flame, uh, an activity that went on 24 hours a day and that is, was extremely dramatic. Evervale and the Heads of the Valleys area were complete with all the raw materials for iron making. Back in the 1750s, they realised that the, uh, the South Wales coal field on its north edge had come to the surface. So from Blaine Avon in the east to Hirwain in the west, a lot of iron works were set up. What um, Archdeacon Cox described as an inhospitable place. Why the heads of the valley? There was uh, local sources of uh, iron ore, obviously essential. There were uh, sources of coal, another important factor, and there was dolomite or limestone. Uh, in the Ebbo Valley, we had three ironworks, Beaufort Ironworks, Ebbville Ironworks and Victorian Ironworks, all producing uh, iron products, bars, billets, and steel rail. Um, the demand for iron made products, in particular rail, was the, the essential driving force. But peripheral to that was all the hardware which went along with railways, like railway wagons, like wheels. Eventually steel rail was desperately needed in the entire world. Everybody looking for rail for steam railways. So every ironworks in the, in the entire Heads of Valley area were all making as much rail as they could. To the people of uh, Ebbo Vale, it meant long-term employment, especially in uh, a valley which was away from the coast where most industries were, were developing. It was essentially um, an area where you had a job for life. Decline in uh, output. There was, it, it was devastating to the people of Ebbervale simply because uh, there was a knock on effect from the steel industry or the iron industry to the coal industry. And of course, the Ebbervale Steel Iron and Coal Company, which owned both, were really in the doldrums. Um, and it led to uh, poverty, deprivation, and it was a terrible time for people because there was unemployment was uh, was rife and uh, in fact at Evervale it peaked at one time to about 50% unemployed in the area. There was no comparison to the works of 1919. The works of 1919 was basically a batch type process all the way through the manufacturing process. 
but with the uh, introduction of the concept of continuous hot rolling, everything was linked up. The works from 1938 on obviously brought all this in new American technology in. Uh, we were making coils of steel, whereas nobody else in Britain or even Europe were making coils. There was a continuation of the process, even to the finishing parts of the plant where a laterolytic tin plate was made in a continuous form, which saw the decline in the tin plate industry by the batch process or the hot dip process. In 1919, straight after the First World War, everybody had high hopes, including the Everville Steel Line and Coal Company, which owned the works at the time. They owned all the coal mines in the area, right down to Risca. They thought trade would take off, but we had a worldwide slump. Uh, it devastated Everville. A lot of the young men, young women had to leave. In, in my case, my father went to London, trained to be a carpenter. My mother went to Oxford and trained to be a nurse. Following the, um, the period where no one had work and the works uh, wasn't um, a source for uh, income, they must have felt uh, they'd won the lottery because uh, uh, they knew that from then on they would have relatively full employment for a long time. The only other town in Britain uh, that was worse was Merthyr Tidville with four ironworks and associated coal mines and they were up in the 60 percent so the the old steel towns the coal towns were all struggling but at that particular time the introduction of the uh, continuous hot rolling uh, process was a lifesaver and meant to deadbeat employment for a long time to come then it was virtually no employment between 31 and 36. Then the contract was signed with Richard Thomas and the word went out, if you come back and help us build the works, you'll have a job. And the job then was felt for life. We have a problem with uh, information which we can uh, look at to assess what was going on during the war years because there was an embargo on all production details. The 1940s, probably during wartime, it would be mostly women at the time because a lot of the men had gone off to fight and so their wives and uh, girlfriends would have actually been producing the steel. Materials would be made for the war effort. Sheet materials for jerry cans. And sh there was a shell making facility introduced so that we actually making the shells for armaments. And a lot of ladies in town learned to be crane drivers, learned to be tractor drivers, and by tractors I don't mean little farm tractors, I mean 42 ton monsters, which could pick up a 20 ton coil. They learned to do that and they learned to do um, inspection of a finished product. And without the ladies, I don't think the works would have survived. Um, many of us would have had re relations, relatives, aunts and that would have worked here. My aunt was a, an armature winder in the place they made the, the winding coils for machines. So it wouldn't have been men through most of the 1940s. The production detail of what was being manufactured at Ebervale uh, were strictly limited because of uh, a government edict. I think you've got to recognise that this was a steel plant of 13,000 people. It was an integrated steel plant, which meant that the, the, they started at the bottom end with iron ore, went through the blast furnaces, through the open blast furnaces, 
Bessemer converters, all of which were areas of making steel, and they were dealing with red hot metal. By that very nature, it was dangerous because any mistake that was made with red hot metal could quite easily uh, land up in people getting killed. A safety aspect, you've only got to look at um, f historical photographs and you can see there, there were no constraints on safety. Over the years there were accidents that you couldn't even describe in the, uh, the danger that people worked in. But it's something, again, we took for granted in many ways, that we just got on with the job. In what was then the tent mill area, two of the um, labourers on the shift had been run over by a heavy tractor. And bearing in mind these tractors were lifting 18 tonnes, 20 tonnes, so they were substantial structures moving around the place. Well, I'm proud and privileged to have been uh, the third generation of my family that worked on the site, my father and my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was an operator on the four stand, temper mill as it was known, and my father was an electrician's mate. And he always told the story of when he entered this place as a young boy with a full head of hair and a full mouth of teeth, he was sent to work on the open pickler. And the open pickler was uh, literally baths of sulfuric acid that were used to clean the strip. And Dad worked there for some months, and while he was there, it literally ate away his hair and his teeth. Not just in any earlier years, but the steel, in steel industry at its very nature is a dangerous occupation. Very experienced operator, was clean in a roll, and was almost cut in half because his side, his uh, clothing had got caught in the moving strip, and it was moving at about two and a half thousand foot a minute and he was caught in it and um, it was thin material like a knife and he, he, he had a very very serious accident and he was lucky he was uh, he survived if i'm honest every member of the plant weren't desperately concerned and desperately worried about the dangers that existed uh, it was only when on the odd occasion we had a bad accident that the danger of the plant was brought fairly firmly home to us. Certainly the hot mill area was extremely dangerous. Um, over the years there were many, many accidents. In fact, one of my relatives, my aunt, was burned to death uh, when a ladle uh, in the site passed over an office she was cleaning in. And the ladle actually tipped the molten metal onto the office and she was never found. Um, Grace, my aunt Grace then, is. Uh, my auntie Nell was so upset about it, they actually buried a coffin, but with no body in it. Um, so you can imagine, uh, molten metal uh, didn't leave any mark whatsoever, she was gone. A very dangerous place to work until you found the way of doing things. You never walked under a crane carrying, carrying stuff towards you, you walked out the way, the crane was in charge, you weren't. You never walked in front of a tractor because a tractor couldn't stop very quickly. All sorts of things and unfortunately with steel uh, as soon as it was made into plate or coil razor sharp edges so big thing on the plant were cuts, cuts to hands and elbows and arms, legs, lots of things with cuts and of course they were very dangerous accidents which unfortunately killed quite a few people. People did things that uh, they would not necessarily Terribly do today or be allowed to do. The whole concept of safety in those days was protect yourself. As far as the management was concerned, they were very concerned about safety, but of course then that, that really had to reflect to the staff and they had to react to it properly. So there was a sort of um, familiarity breeding contempt approach. We ran at one time we ran 36 steam locos on the plant and one of the jobs was the, the latchman who had a, a long pole with an iron hook on the end had to pick up the, the latches as we called it to, to, to make up a train. Well he, they had a nasty habit of rather than going back to the engine they just sit on the end of the latch pole as the train moved off. Well quite a few of them fell off and got killed. Um, one of the, the obvious ones to me is um, hearing uh, 
protection was never even considered uh, in the old days, but now there are, there are, are rules which you have to adhere to. It is an entirely different concept of working in heavy industry in the early days compared to um, more recent years. The people who worked there took it in their stride. They knew where they could go, when they couldn't go. Unfortunately, if you were visiting, they wouldn't tell you. <laughs> they were a bit naughty, some of them. The characters in the works would be too numerous to mention because there was thousands of characters in the works. And the works itself, they built characters as well. Um, but I guess the stories that people tell most of all are people like uh, Tommy Tomato and Billy Laugh Egg. Um, Billy Laugh Egg always had in his box a whole egg and half an egg. And so he was known as Billy Laugh Egg. Ivy Hill, who was the manager of the Estates Department when I came to, quite a character, an ex major uh, in the bomb squadron in the, in the Second World War, did not suffer fools gladly, in fact of the old type school. Um, he had a big influence upon me. I tried my best not to be like him. Very interesting characters that uh, I ever got involved with is a guy called Arthur Button who worked in the mobile with me. And Arthur firmly believed that he was due for thespian experience on the stage. He really believed that he could make it the big time. And there was a program at the time, Huey Green, Opportunity Knox, that if you're real old, you'll remember it and we persuaded Arthur that he was on the show and he actually gave an audition on the phone to supposedly to the guy to the guy himself and it was brilliant but that was just one example of uh, the eccentric behavior of Arthur because he genuinely believed he was really good he used to make tea in what was known then as a billy can uh, but there were certain individuals had their own method of protecting uh, their billy can full of tea because immediately uh, you would walk away from your billy can, someone would help themselves to a drop of your tea. One individual in particular used to rinse his false teeth in, in the tea before he left and he knew full well no one would touch it after that. And Mr Sam Mutters, um, who was youth club leader. He was from uh, the east end of London, had been a commando in the uh, Second World War. He had in fact run a youth club where the Cray brothers um, were young, young recruits. He came to Ebervale in a completely different atmosphere down here, headed up the um, youth club. He was an education officer as well as that. Uh, a marvellous man, huge influence on the youngsters in this particular area at the time and had a very, very, very successful youth club which had a variety of, a of activities. He stands out in my mind in my early, early, early youth. One of the operators with one glass eye and his favourite trick was to drop his eye in the can of tea and if anybody pinched it, he would show them the eye afterwards which is uh, not very nice, not very pleasant. There were a lot of characters around. I could write a book on that because I was out on shifts. You used to see people at their lowest point. Dark days, we used to call them, but there were a lot of characters around. I was introduced to a guy. At the time, there was no uh, retirement age in Richard Thompson Baldwin. As long as the men could do the job, they carried on till they finished. But I was introduced to one man, and to me, he seemed about 80. I don't know how old, exactly how old he was, but he told me the filthiest joke I'd ever heard in my life. And I nearly fell off the chair. I thought, how can somebody that old know such a filthy joke as that? And then you suddenly realise these people have got a tale to tell. And I honestly believe youngsters today are missing out on all this because you come into contact with all different age groups, all different backgrounds, all different... Well, all the different ideas. And you share it. You share your ideas. You share your problems. Uh, huge characters. And I think that's what the place was about. In some respects, it wasn't just the fact that we made the best 
steel and iron in the world. It was the fact that um, we had a family of steel. The people that worked here belonged to each other. And uh, every family in the borough and beyond had uh, someone that worked in the steelworks. So the place itself was character and character building. And that was part of growing up in the steelworks. And you had to grow up pretty quick, otherwise you'd be wandering around with your trousers missing. <laughs> I think when it came to 1970, it became apparent to all of us that um, certainly the hot end, the hot steel end, hot metal end, were, was under threat. And that, those thoughts came to fruition that the steel, the hot end did uh, close fairly quickly. But we also felt, I think if I'm being basically honest, we knew that was the beginning of the end of the plant anyway. And so consequently, um, it was an extremely sad period. Well, in 1978, uh, when the heavy end closed, we all thought that was the end of the works uh, because without this, the iron and steel making process, uh, I think the feel at that time was that it, it was the beginning of the end. As we know, the coal mill part of the plant continued right up until 2002. Um, but the loss of the heavy end was a huge blow. And if you think at that time, I started, as I said, sometime a little before that, um, there were some 9,000 people here in 1978. Uh, to lose over half of that was a devastation at the time. And, and in all honesty, something we've never really recovered from. Uh, I, I felt for the area because I knew as one of the biggest employers the effect that would have. Particularly on young people because this particular works had done so much to train young people. Now that has suddenly disappeared. The decline in... Uh, bulk steel making could could be seen as a spin-off of the development of coastal of the coastal plants and in particular Eberville as most people knew would be affected by the development of uh, deep water ports like Flantwern who would take over the, the major steel making part of any industry and it was then following um, the decision to close the heavy end of uh, Eberville Works which obviously included the steel making part. The closure program uh, was engineered in a way that the blast furnaces, uh, then the steel making processes and then the hot rolling processes all, all closed by instalments. So over a period of time, and that would have been um, after 1973 uh, to about 1979, when I returned, most of those departments had already been, had already been closed. The decision by uh, the senior executives in the business to um, curtail um, the steelmaking activity didn't only affect steelmaking, but... Uh, affected what we call the heavy end of the plant. Uh, the development that followed in the finishing end was seen uh, as a major lifeline to a lot of people. The closure that was announced in 2001, the February of 2001, was a body blow because it was something we didn't expect. We'd gone through a number of redundancies prior to that and cut our workforce to a, a figure that was just over a thousand core workers and so we'd taken a lot of blows over the years and we certainly didn't effect full, expect full closure um, but for us as a workforce and a works council it was absolutely devastating. Apart from all the other things which, 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 which had an effect in respect of that closure, the social program, the, everything went with it, the Deboville was such a big, a big influence on the community of this town so yes I was very very sad indeed when that did in fact happen and the future looked pretty bleak I thought in in 2002 for this community. I was in the museum and someone from the BBC came came out to ask would I be prepared to be interviewed because apparently uh, other people didn't want to be interviewed about the closure program but um, 
when I was being interviewed, I feel, felt really emotional about it, and I had a job to get through the interview. And you can imagine the, the people that worked here for 25, 30 years had known no other work. And all of a sudden, that, that family, as I said, the family of steel, was being dismantled. I was quite sad when the work shut. I was 56 at the time. I had a very good package for finishing. Nobody offered me a job outside the plant. Uh, my one regret was I'd had 38 years of experience and I had nobody to pass it on to. That was my big regret, that I couldn't teach somebody, you know, what I thought was the right way of doing things. We actually, as a works council, spent the two years from 2001 through to the closure itself in 2002. And we worked extremely hard with management. It was a full-blown works council then, different than years prior, prior to that, I guess, when there was always a, a battle between unions and management. But we were all in the same boat. We faced closure together. And we were actually successful in transferring over 350 people from this site to other steelworks, to Clamwern, Port Talbot, Trostra and to Imoiden in Holland. When the steel making end and the iron making ended, there were all sorts of schemes put in, government schemes of, of retraining people, uh, they were paying relocation expenses and they were offering a, a nice packages to retire early. In 2002, I think it was a little different. Um, first of all, there weren't quite as many workers. We're talking in, in uh, there were 700 people working here in in 2002 when the works closed. Some did take advantage of that and go over to Holland, and I've, sub I've spoken to them subsequently, and they've, they've, they, they feel very happy over there. After closure, there was a, a plan which really was um, a, a redeployment plan. Um, those who didn't wish to retire with the, the financial package that was on offer were being offered employment in uh, other parts of the industry. Um, Clan Wern, Port Talbot, and I think uh, people even went to Tavanabach. They gave opportunities to people to go into other, uh, other factors, other industries, etc., etc. Uh, but with the best will in the world to accommodate 13,000 jobs was virtually, was impossible. And uh, once those jobs had gone, the quality of life in the community was reduced dramatically. I think it goes down as one of the most successful closures of a site of this size uh, in history. Um, but having said that, you still had some 900 people to 1,000 people who had to find work. And in all honesty, that work hasn't been in this borough for a long, long time. Way back to 78, when we lost the heavy end. We've had some investment we have, but we've never seen the, the employment figures as they were then. And we've suffered ever since. And in all honesty, the, the unemployment of the area is, is not just due to the steelworks, but it certainly didn't help. When the iron and steel making processes um, were, um, uh, were ended, of course we had 150 acres of land down there, which I was involved with, with, with the department, that uh, had to be demolished. Uh, I say that the land, I meant the, the plant, the machinery taken away. So it would have been a, a moonscape down there and a a cosmetic exercise, virtually, to restore the area. Um, it would have looked something like a moonscape, uh, and it subsequently did look like a, a moonscape down there. But, of course, the salvation came in 1988 when the borough of Blaine Gwent, who wanted to put an application in for the National Garden Festival. Well, the Garden Festival of 1992, the last National Garden Festival in Britain, uh, was also the most successful. Um, it was built to attract two million visitors, and they did just that. So in the great scheme of things, it was a success. And in all honesty, it regenerated an area of this valley that needed regeneration. The hot mill had closed, and there was a devastation across that end of the valley. 
and so it cleaned it up and it created some work but obviously it would never replace the jobs the number of jobs the quality of pay of the type of jobs that were here when the steelworks was open so yes it had a big influence in the area and yes as an ex steel worker I could say that it, it did a, a great deal for the town in, and if you look down there now you can see the benefits of that and that certainly wouldn't have been apparent if the garden festival had not taken place in 1992. The development of the garden festival I, I believe was um, a concept by the, the WDA and works management and government to um, use it as a, a method of uh, bringing some life back into the area which, which had uh, gone into decline for many years. There were a hell of a lot of sheds left on the site and seeing what British Steel had done in the past, I honestly thought they'd be there resting for the next 20 years before something was done about it. As it happened, something was done immediately and uh, demolition started straight away. It took them five years to knock it all down and clear it away. As far as the morale of the town was concerned, it improved dramatically. The year of the festival was absolutely brilliant. The number of people we had in from outside, obviously in terms of bringing money into the community, was a mega, mega bonus. And the one thing the festival had was that when it finished, it didn't land up into the sort of tip-like areas that other garden festivals did. We were determined at the time that it would continue to develop into a shopping centre and a major facility where people could still use it as a recreation park. And that exists to this day. Well, I'm delighted what's going on. I've got to be. And I'm, I'm really delighted that the general offices have survived. This is a, I know it's a, a listed building, but um, the, uh, the building is, is the sort of... Um, is um, a, a lasting um, legacy to what was once here. And I didn't want to see it go, but it had to go. And then we had regeneration then. We got brand new hospital, two brand new schools. Well, it's one brand new school, but it's in two different areas. New uh, sports grounds, some housing. Hopefully there will be more housing. A new leisure centre is just going up. And of course we've got the new college, which is just open. Now I live right behind the site. I've looked at sheds all my life. And all the muck can do it. I can now see green mountains. Still see stinking sheep mine. But to me, great. Anybody want to spend money in Everville, please come and spend it. Um, a lot of the buildings down there are buildings that will replace buildings that presently exist. For example, the three comprehensive schools, uh, the hospital because it, it replaces the old Ebervale Hospital, the technical college which will now be a far more developed a technical structure and the new, what effectively is the new comprehensive school. Um, are all parts of mega improvements. They are state-of-the-art structures and the people of Blyna Grant will benefit absolutely amazingly from them. So to the see the site regenerated is wonderful. The sadness to me is all we've tended to do is close buildings in other parts of the borough to relocate them to this site. We're closing a leisure centre, we're closing four or five schools to open one, we've closed three hospitals to open one, and we've moved Evervale College down here. Um, so the job creation is extremely limited. In fact, I would go so far as to say we've probably lost jobs rather than created them um, by the regenerating the site in the way we have. But having said that, it's better than just a hole in the ground. Um, so we, we must take what we can get and, and, and build from there. There are developments down there that are new. There are houses whose... Um, fuel economies in terms of saving money. For example, they've got houses down there where it, only, it will only take £80 a year to actually heat and give water and any other form of electrical source that you want. And that's not a myth, it's happening. People are living those, people are um, uniquely living those, in those houses uh, as uh, an experiment for a year. And all of them are said to date that it's really 
the only amount of money it's cost them. So that is a mega development and, and will be increased. Those houses will become an, insta an estate. But to see the, the area where the plant was developed is fantastic because it was derelict and that was tragic. Well, clearly, if you lose the number of jobs that we did, that cannot possibly have benefited the area. The people in Blaine Gwent suffered during the 13 to 14 year period where the plant was reduced to nothing. Well, it's been 11 years now since the works are shut, and it's definitely uh, a big loss, a huge loss to the County Borough of Blaine Gwent simply because we haven't had much manufacturing in to replace it. We've had small factories. We've had Uasa Battery, which is, to be fair, has been here quite a long time. But we've had others who took advantage of two years rates free and rent free, came for the two years and then buggered it off. I suppose the, this, the historical legacy, you must remember that Ebo Vale was once um, a major player in the iron and steel industry. In fact, this works at Eberville was the flagship of the industry. So from that particular uh, point of view, um, it's left in a very, very important part. Um, I'm sorry, it's not gonna play that part ever again, but we must be very proud of the fact what it did um, from 1790 to 2002. The, leg the main legacy, I guess, is, is memories is the memory of a wonderful place to work. And as someone said to me some little time ago, it wasn't about the buildings or the steel, it was about the people. And the people that worked together that, that literally died in some cases uh, for the steel works. Um, they were a family and they, they loved each other and the people you, the friends you met then have stayed with you forever. Unfortunately, unemployment is raising its ugly head again in the valleys. and. A lot of youngsters have just moved out. My, I've got two daughters, they've moved out to get work. If you'd asked me what legacy the works gave us while it was in operation, that would be very easy. It would, it would have been easy to say, well, the quality of life in Blaine Grant, the standard of living in Blaine Grant, was superior probably to anywhere else in Wales. A wonderful workforce. You, you hear about the miners talking about the camaraderie, it's exactly the same in the steelworks. You'd have teams of men who wouldn't, wouldn't alter departments. They were offered promotion. They wouldn't go because they were leaving their crews. Uh, and for the area, we still have a link to that time through the Steel Men. Uh, Eberville Rugby Club obviously has the name, the Steel Men. Um, so the, the world still knows about Eberville. A lot of fun, a lot of games. 95% of them enjoyed it. The other 5% were pain in the butt. But you always get them everywhere the finest steel, the finest iron makers in the world. And that is the legacy. The Bessemer converter, the first productive Bessemer converter was on this site. Henry Bessemer came here himself. So the legacy is the process of steel and iron making and the part that Ebervale has played in it and the people of Ebervale and Blaine Gwent, the wider uh, valley communities as well. Uh, a good employer, good wages enabled a lot of people to get on in the world, especially the apprenticeship schemes. That's one thing we have mentioned. Big loss, a big, big loss to youngsters, all the apprentices. At one time, there were 80 apprentices going in every year. All of those went all over the world. And if you went to an employer in Britain and said, I was British Steel uh, apprentice or an RDB apprentice, you had, you had a good start. So no, the closure of the plant didn't benefit us. But what's happened since has taken a long time, but we get in there. On a site that once held the steelworks of Ebervale, and now being regenerated 
with new schools and a college. This site that played such an important part in steel making throughout the world from 1790 to its closure in 2002. This valley was the Valley of Steel 